What's up, everybody? Uh, thank you for everybody that's logging on and those that will be listening on the recording. We appreciate you um, taking the time out of your day to come uh, chat with us and, and be a part of the student social. Uh, I like to introduce everybody um, to our speaker uh, for this evening is uh, Colonel Tayen. Um, and we'll be discussing with her different things um, about leadership and, and, and pursuing um, that potential you have. An announcement we'd like to make um, before starting off is that the Future of Physical Therapy Summit, um, which is gonna be Monday, September 13th from 8.30 to 3 p.m. Eastern time, um, this event will have physical therapy leaders from around the world, including Colonel Tehan, um, and they will deliver insight and inspiration around advancing the profession, building community, and improving the health of society. Registration to attend virtually is still open, and best of all, it's free. Um, so we'll have that uh, link in the chat box. Um, thank you, Teo. And I'd like to uh, bring on um, our speaker, Colonel Tayen. Uh, she is a APTA member, uh, PT, PhD, and she's been appointed chief of the Army's Medical uh, Specialist Corps. Um, so she oversees PTs, occupational therapists, dietitians, physicians assistants um, throughout the branch. And she's also a board certified specialist um, in orthopedic physical therapy. So uh, Colonel Tayen, um, please take the floor and, and tell us more about yourself and, and your journey um, on, on pursuing leadership and, and inspire and how we can do, do the same. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm so excited to speak with you all today. You know, the one thing I'd like to start with is you're joining the best profession there is in medicine. I honestly believe physical therapy is the best profession across all the healthcare professionals because we get to spend so many times with our so much time with our patients and really change their lives, really the quality of their lives. And we get to do so without the pills, potions, and procedures that really have a lot of questionable benefits sometimes, um, depending on the trials and, and the studies. We work with people on their goal and on their journey um, to a better state of health. And really, when you think of the healthcare system and the need to transition that from a healthcare system to a system for health, it's allied health professionals like physical therapists that are going to be so key to getting the nation to move forward. The other really cool part about entering our profession is that as you look at all the different board certifications, you can reinvent yourself so many times in our profession as your personal and professional goals change, whether you want to do orthopedics, pediatrics, um, neuro, et cetera, you're able to kind of really reinvent that as your personal goals change. But it's not just about the patient care that you get to really change. You also get to change what, how you experience being a physical therapist. Are you being that clinician? Are you actually going into education and training and, and teaching at a, a PT or a PTA program? Are you going to move into research? And what we're really talking about today is that leadership realm. You know, as I first started my career, all I ever wanted to do is be a, a clinician. And there's nothing more important than the interaction between a patient and their provider. But as I was meeting different physical therapists, I was really inspired thinking, how can I actually help create the next generation of physical therapists? And to do that, I, I went back and got my PhD at UT Austin in biomechanics and went back and taught for about seven years at Army Baylor. And I thought I would do that for the rest of my time in the Army. I had really no other goals or desires to to do anything but to teach and to um, practice orthopedic physical therapy. Um, I then deployed to Iraq and I was on the uh, Iranian border and we have what's called combat support hospitals. And so while at that combat support hospital, I was there just to see patients. Well, there was a little bit of a vacuum of leadership and, and I was ended up asked to actually run the combat support hospital, that slice in al Quds, Iraq. And then I actually realized that, that all that education and training I learned to getting my PhD and being a physical therapist really prepared me actually for leadership and the ability to create a system of systems that really allow 
um, for all healthcare professionals to interact and to expand and to really optimize the performance of the whole team. And that was really interesting to me. And it really was something that I kind of planned on. So when I got back from Iraq, um, I was then selected to command what's called Public Health Command Region South. So then I was really responsible for the public health efforts for the 11 southeastern states and some places in the Caribbean. And um, really there, I realized that as a physical therapist, how we interact with evidence-based um, practice and really what we understand about how linking the best evidence into practice, when you do that as a leader, you can make a big difference. You can really make sure that the policies and procedures being, being put into place are really aligned with best practices based on the literature. And so that really got me excited. And so then after that, um, I was then uh, um, selected to go be the deputy of what's called the Telemedicine Advanced Technology Research Center. And so I was then leading a research organization. Um, and from there, the Surgeon General, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, she pulled me up to really run um, what's uh, was called the performance triad, but really it's a holistic approach to looking at health. And we'll, we'll come back to her in a minute. And that was absolutely phenomenal to be really at the policy level, working for the Surgeon General and really trying to figure out how do you change a healthcare system to a system that focus on health, to focus on people where they live, love and labor, and really not so much about pills, potions, and procedures? How do you get the healthcare system to be optimized to really raise the health of everybody we serve? And that was just a phenomenal opportunity. And what was really nice right after that is that then they um, put me in charge of commanding a healthcare facility in Hawaii. And when you command a, a military healthcare facility, it's obviously the hospital, the healthcare setting, but you're also kind of like the public health expert for that whole installation. So it's almost like you're also running the public health uh, department of a city for the mayor, right? And so what I was able to do is put into place all the different resources um, that really medicine brings to the fight to help soldiers and family members and their children get to the optimal health. And I'll give you two interesting examples just to give you an idea of what I mean is, you know, we have a lot of folks that have behavioral health conditions and concerns, and that can manifest into chronic pain. But a lot of times that deals with financial insecurity and financial stress around families. Well, what was really interesting is there was, we have what's called Army Community Services on an installation, and that deals with really financial education and training. And there wasn't a way to link providers to actually refer outside of a healthcare setting to these financial um, educators to really help patients get at the true cause of some of their chronic pain and behavioral health and, and marital and family problems. And that really created a lot of synergy. We did the same thing with chaplains, really bringing in spiritual fitness along with the behavioral health to really augment and support that. Another really interesting example, if you can think about young families in Hawaii um, that really start to have their own babies, there's really no way to quickly drive and have mom and dad and grandma and grandpa and aunts and uncles come and help you learn how to be a mother. So these young families were incredibly isolated. So instead of them having to go through their health journey while they were pregnant by themselves, we put them in a cohort with um, people all delivering about the same time. And that way, and every week they would actually create the agenda of what they were interested in learning. And we'd bring the healthcare experts in to help them on that journey. And then when they all delivered and they had a question, even though they couldn't have their aunts and uncles and, and brothers and sisters and everybody come in to help, they already had a network around them. So it was a lot of fun to really think about how do you create a healthcare system that is more about health and making sure people are on that journey to health. Well, after I left there, I was selected to go to a higher level command and, and I commanded what's called the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. And the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research is the Department of Defense's largest biomedical um, research facility. And they do, um, they trace their history back to some of the first vaccine efforts in the United States 
um, back to 1897. The really only other company that is that old in the pharmaceutical world is Merck. Merck is about three years older than the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. They also do all the behavioral health, brain, sleep research. Um, and so it's a really interesting organization. Um, little did I know that COVID would hit, right? And so our efforts completely shifted to, to focusing on the COVID, um, COVID efforts. And after that um, assignment, I was then brought up um, by General Perna, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen on TV, to really lead the therapeutic efforts at Operation Warp Speed. And, and so we really were focused not on the vaccine efforts, but how do you bring monoclonal antibodies out to folks as quickly as possible, really at what's the velocity of relevance um, to really ensure that we can treat those that get COVID that are at high risk for severe disease. And so it was an honor um, of my lifetime to serve on Operation Warp Speed. And then along the way then, um, at that point, I got notified that I was selected to be really the Army's first physical therapist to be promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. And so I'm incredibly honored as we get ready to hit 100 years um, celebration um, in these upcoming weeks to really be able to break that glass ceiling. And although I'm honored to, to do that, it really is standing on the shoulders of some major giants. When you look back at our profession and you go all the way back to World War I when we were reconstruction aides, most of the giants that started our profession really started in the military. And so to be able to stand on the shoulders of these giants who gave us such an amazing profession and such a gift that we all benefit from today is quite amazing. But the true sign of success will be if there's a second and third uh, physical therapist that makes it to general as, as the years pass, because that's really what we want to do is is build that, that pipeline and, and, and build that opportunities for physical therapists to lead at the highest level and, and to be really healthcare executives. So that's some opening comments. I, I hope that's sufficient. Um, I, I know we really wanna get into some question and answers, but so I'll, I'll turn it back over, but that's who I am. And, and um, really, if, if before we go to the Q and A, I hope that you want to see yourself in any of those positions going on. And I would say it's a journey because really I had no idea as a student um, that I would be able to uh, be a, a, a senior healthcare executive. Really, the, at the time, the, the most senior position when I was in school in 1993 to 1995 was you could be the chief of physical therapy at a large medical center. That was kind of our glass ceiling back then. And then they started to allow us to command small healthcare facilities. And then we, we kept going to bigger and bigger as we continued to demonstrate the value that we really bring. Um, and because we see the healthcare system through such a different lens than most of the providers that really are focused on surgery or, or larger procedures that are really critical for a person in a, a period of their time, but really it's that journey to health and getting them back um, to be able to do the things they love that's really critical. And, and that's where I think our expertise and what we bring to the fight is so important. Thank you, Colonel Zahan, um, for giving us, giving us that background and information. And again, to all those uh, attending, please feel free to raise your hand um, place a question in the chat box. Um, or when you raise your hand, we'll, we'll have you come on and you can say that question yourself. Um, but a question that we do have uh, for you at the moment, you talked about um, those giants, right? Um, and, and how we, we're on their shoulders. Um, the question I have for you, uh, Colonel Tehan, is, is there any particular giant or, or a mentor um, that helped you make these decisions um, as you were going through your professional career? Yeah, I would say um, two there, and mentorship is incredibly important, and it's not just mentorship, but sponsorship that's really um, key. Um, and, you know, if you go back historically, um, really, believe it or not, until 1957, only women were allowed to join the Women's Medical Specialist Corps. We then became the Army Medical Specialist Corps in 57 when we allow men in. It took a, until almost 1989 till men were actually up at the senior levels of leadership within our Corps, which is a little bit different than everybody else in the Army. And so there's some really amazing, strong female leaders that obviously 
Um, you guys all know from reading the history of our profession. Um, but in my um, really career field uh, or my time frame, um, it was people like David Greathouse who really pushed the envelope for direct access that we all now experience across all 50 states. That really started in Vietnam in 1971. There was people like Nancy Henderson who was there that really demonstrate the value of us being physician extenders. And then individuals like David Greathouse who really kept pushing that envelope of what we can do um, to where at least in the military, not only do we have direct access, but we can order all imaging and a, a, a suite of therapeutics um, for pharmaceutical um, support in our, in our therapy efforts, as well as activity restrictions and the whole thing really in referrals, right? So we really benefit from that. And I think it was that key transition of allowing us to have full direct access um, to really demonstrate how we can be leaders within the healthcare organization. My mentor and sponsor though was um, Lieutenant General, now retired Patty Horaho. She was the first um, non-physician and first female to make it to the rank of Lieutenant General and she became the Army's first female nurse, Surgeon General. And she really came in and saw the healthcare system through a different lens. And she realized that you just like the Broadway show Rent, um, there's 525,600 minutes a year, but most patients are only a patient for about a hundred minutes a year. And obviously those that see physical therapy, it's more than a hundred minutes a year, but nonetheless, so it means that other 525,500 minutes where people live, love and labor is where health happens. Patients don't get healthy. People get healthy because you're only a patient when you're in that appointment. And so Thinking that away is really revolutionary because it realizes that that motivational interviewing that we do, getting patients to accept a goal and the journey they're on is really critical because only when we become a coach with that patient, can we take them on that journey. And not only was she an amazing mentor to me, but she also what I would say sponsored me, right? And so that's when you have someone senior to you that's advocating that, hey, we should allow her to break this glass ceiling and take this um, senior leader position, right? She then became my advocate as I supported her vision and, and, and pushed it um, to accelerate it at the velocity of relevance. Um, and so um, she was both my mentor and my sponsor. Thank you for that, Colonel Tahan. Um, and before we go to any of the other questions, we're going to have a brief segment of announcements um, given to us by our nominating committee uh, chair elect Tayo. Hello, everyone. I hope you are enjoying the event currently at the moment. So we have a few quick announcements. So first one is going to be that we have the ABTA Student Assembly Network still open until Sunday, September 12th. We have our leader right now, Chase, with us also. So it's a way for us to connect between SPTs and SPTAs to be more involved with the House of Delegates. Um, also allows our SPT delegate to receive feedback on particular House of Delegates motions and policy issues from student members. We have a link for the group meet so we can put that in the chat as well if you would like to join. We also wanted to just make a congratulations to all the members who were elected for the APTA's uh, Board of Directors and nominating committee yesterday. So. Roger Herr was elected as president. Susan Appling was elected as vice president. We have Sydney Armstrong was re-elected as director. We also have Zohar Kapasi who was elected as director. Kim Nixon Cave who was elected as director and Stephanie Weyrauch was elected to the nominating committee. So again, congratulations to everyone. Last, we have our first uh, PT Journal Action Potential Journal Club. This is going to happen on Tuesday, August 31st at 8 p.m. Eastern time. It's going to be hosted by the PTJ social media team, which is going to be Dr. Jason Falvey and the PTJ student member, Devin Morse. This is going to feature Dr. Jason Cherry, and it's going to be centered around the importance of therapeutic alliance. We will also put in the link to the article that they will be discussing and the link for Engage, and that will be due tomorrow for signing up. And that is all we have for announcements. So if there is anything that you would like to know in terms of other information, please feel free to reach out to us. Back to you, Gustavo. 
Thank you, Teo. Um, and we got a raised hand from Chase. So Chase, you got a question for uh, the Colonel Tahan? Yes, uh, Colonel Tan, thank you so much for being with us tonight and, and thanks for your service. Um, and you you kind of got to a little bit of it, but I'd, I'd love to, to hear from you more from like a maybe entry level perspective. Um, but I, I know that it can be difficult in trying to convince other professions that PTs uh, can step into some of these spaces that are maybe more geared toward what they believe a nurse can do. And I'm thinking specifically with my last CI, there was a leadership opportunity that came up, but uh, which, you know, as a PT, I could see her being totally qualified for, but one of the, one of the qualifications they were requiring uh, was that it be uh, a nurse. Uh, and so my question for you then is, uh, what, what do you feel we can do as physical therapists to advocate for ourselves for these, maybe not as big of leadership things as, as you've talked about, but some of the smaller opportunities uh, stepping into some of those spaces as PTs? It, what a phenomenal question. And, you know, I would say that every time I had the opportunity, even if it was leading a, a, a relatively smaller PT clinic, I really treated it as an opportunity to learn how to um, enhance my leadership op, um, capabilities and skills, right? And part of that is understanding what to do to support your team while at the same time supporting the leaders above you. And so part of your time, you're the coach, teach, and mentor down and in. And the other part of the times you're a scout looking up and, and making sure you're meeting the needs of the leaders that are senior to you in the organization. And it's really those opportunities that really create more opportunities, right? So when I, and I'll give an example more recently. So when I was running the healthcare facility at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii, I expected every one of them, I had um, probably 50 some clinics um, over 23 buildings, et cetera. But I expected everyone running a clinic to be good down and in. Who really shined to me were those folks that helped make sure that we met the whole organization was achieving its goals, right? So not only was the, the clinic chief, a, again, one of those great entry level leadership opportunities, not only were you running a good clinic, but you were making sure the whole organization was successful with its strategic, um, with its strategy and making sure that when you had the ability to play into it, you could. So the example I would give is, you know, we had a, um, when I was at Kimbrough and I was a, a captain at the time, there was a policy that was put out for all the clinics to follow this new rule that would be great for a patient-centered medical home concept, but would not work at the time I was leading the PT orthopediatry clinic, and it would not have worked well at all for us. So instead of going down and saying, hey, this doesn't work, I, I went down and said, hey, I think this is the vision you have for the organization. I, I said, I think this is the goals you're trying to set for us. And I said, I see how your policy makes so much sense for the patient center medical home. I said, for us in orthopediatry and PT to have that same effect, I need to adjust that a little bit. And I would suggest this policy be adjusted for us. And um, the guy at the time was kind of hard to work for. He was a little prickly, um, but he actually said, oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. He said, go forth, do great things. And so it's, it's not the big steps that matter. It's taking those little steps, knowing that you're not just leading, let's say a PT clinic for, for a hospital, but you're also part of that hospital success. And then as you gain momentum and making sure that the goals of your team is fitting in and nested with the goals of the, the organization, um, then more opportunities open up. And so Really, at first, in the military setting, what we started to see is because the PT clinics were run so well that they started putting PT in charge of PT and OT, and then even the PM&R, right? There was many times PTs were in charge of PM&R also, um, which is physiatrist, right? So, um, sorry, I'm using military acronyms, but physical medicine and rehabilitation, but really the physiatrist that 
um, work we work with a lot of times. Um, and what was happening is then they would see the success of our, what our, I think our innate leadership skills are as PTs, because I think the quality of the qualities that make you a good physical therapist make you a good leader, right? We have to listen. Uh, we have to understand truly the goals of our patients and figure out how to get after that. That's a key leadership trait. We then have to have a lot of empathy, right? People don't want to do what we normally ask them to do. They don't want to do it, but we get them to do it because we start with the heart and we find a connection with that patient, just like you have to do for organization change. And then we do it through motivational interviewing and we make sure that we bring the organization along or the patient along with us for the journey in, in a leadership position, you're just bringing them along also, and we're doing it very similarly. So I would say that the traits that make people good physical therapists make them a good leader. And as you apply that, more doors open, um, because it wasn't my goal to move into leadership. That was never really, uh, it wasn't possible, right? The, the, the highest position I could have been when I was a second lieutenant looking at what does an 06 look like, our colonel looks like. It was just being a PT chief in a large med center. But because people kept getting more and more opportunities because they kept being successful, more and more doors opened. Thank you very much. Oh, I have one more alibi. I do think though it will be a um, cultural change, just like you know, direct access in the military started in 1971 and now we have it really for all 50 states to some extent. I think the benefits we see in the military by having physical therapists and leadership positions um, will start to, to kind of bleed over, but it, it, it won't happen overnight. The good news is some of the real big healthcare executive groups, um, there's a group called the Studer Group that trains healthcare executives. They actually have physical therapists that are part of their training staff because they've already noticed that benefit. So we're, we're starting to see it happening. And we also know, especially from the private practice group in APTA, just how powerful some of our PT leaders can be. And although that group is really private practice and it's is people that are leading their own physical therapy groups or chains of clinic, really the next step is for them to say, hey, is it really about private practice or is it also private practice and being able to be a healthcare executive for large healthcare chains? Because those rules we want to change, the rules that we see when we look at the healthcare system and how it could be better, you have to actually be in a leadership position to force those changes to move forward. So we need to, I, in my opinion, move into more professional or, or healthcare executive roles so that those things that we see that if they could be changed would make the healthcare system better for the patients we serve, we'll be in positions to actually make those changes. So, um, but it does start with baby steps, right? It's one small step at a time. Thank you for that, uh, Colonel Tehan. We have a question here from uh, Casey. Um, he typed in the chat. Um, he says, uh, yes, what is the process for a civilian new grad um, SPT to become a military PT? Um, he's considering pursuing Air Force or Army. So we're always looking for amazing PTs to join the military. Um, and there is what's called medical recruiters. You can't just go to a normal recruiter. You have to go to either an Air Force, Army, or Navy medical recruiter. The easiest place to find where to go for that is actually on the U.S. Army Baylor University website, the DPT program website. And on that website, there's a link for recruiters. Now, granted, that link's there for people that want to come into the Army Baylor program. But they're the same people that bring in folks, what we call direct accessions after they have their PT degree. And we really are looking for a lot of folks because the Army, you, you know, I told you I worked for General Horaho. We were doing what's called performance triad. The success of that made the Army see that the, we need to open what's called holistic health and fitness. And so as the Army's rolled out holistic health and fitness, they're putting PTs, OTs, dietitians athletic trainers and strength and conditioning coaches down at the unit level. So we really do have a need to continue to grow. Um, and, and, and so it, those that are interested, you know, a medical recruiter is, is the way to go. I, I would say um, across the services, there is some differences, um, but really all three of them 
give you such an ability to serve our nation. Um, and uh, it, it is so incredibly rewarding. It, it really gets at a fundamental why, right? Of, of uh, you know, what do you do? What is your why when you wake up in the morning? What makes you excited about what you do? And uh, for me, um, it was my first deployment to Bosnia um, in which I realized that by treating people far forward on the battlefield and keeping their pain under control meant that they were coming home to their spouses and their children because they had the ability to not be in pain while they were outside the wire and their vigilance could stay higher. They were more alert. They weren't thinking about pain. They were thinking about the mission. And in doing so, our, our American sons and daughters are better able to come home safely. And uh, ever since that, I, I knew I was hooked. Um, and, and, and this was a career for me. Thank you for sharing that, uh, Colonel Tahan. Um, there's also a comment there from um, Stacy saying, no questions, but uh, she was a research assistant at WRAIR. Um, I don't know what that means. So if you want to see if you can explain or Colonel Tahan. <laughs> well, Stacy, thank you for being a research assistant at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research or RARE. Um, we really, um, it's the foundation and I am so glad to, see that you worked at RARE and then came over and became a physical therapist or vice versa on the timing. Um, but it is a real gem. I mean, it, it really is an amazing, um, it's amazing organization. And as I see Stacy's one of our PTAs is I think what just popped up in the chat box um, and really appreciate that. And uh, um, anyways, I'm glad you, you had the experience of, of Walter Reed. It, it clearly is a magical place. So, Colonel Tahan, you were saying earlier um, about developing, you know, as, as PTs, we come uh, with these attributes, uh, attributes that we use in our, in our profession and that can be translated in, into these leadership positions like listening, empathizing, connecting to the heart, that um, motivational uh, interviewing and speaking with patients. Um, and some people, I guess, have, have said that this throughout the years, those are kind of considered soft skills. Uh, right. Um, in school, we're, we, we're taught about these concepts, um, but usually um, we're always graded on hard skills. Right. What do we know? What can we our knowledge of anatomy, physiology um, and so forth, or how to do uh, an evaluation to get to the right diagnosis, but not necessarily how can you gauge connecting with a patient? Because uh, a lot of these actors um, may not always be or, or, or our classmates who we sometimes use as our as our. Um, as our clinical experience to, to go through checkouts, you know, that we're not there to connect heart to heart. We're, just, we're there to learn and say, hey, you got this, we're gonna do this and we're gonna fix this. So how would you say, um, Colonel Tehan, um, as us students, many of us here that are students and, and, and soon to graduate in a year, two years or three years, um, or just graduated, how would you advise us to, to keep growing with those skills and, and, and any advice that you've had along the way through your journey? Yeah, so I, what a great point. And absolutely, I, I remember that um, very much as my experience also. You know, once you get outside of the student setting, you really become what's called a problem solver, right? You, you have this patient in front of you and you are solving problems um, for that individual. And it requires you to, to be successful, to have those soft skills but to really realize that what you're doing is helping solve problems. And some of those problems are clinical problems. Some of them are financial problems because of can they come in? Can they not come in for, for the things? Some of them are with assisted devices. Some of them are figuring out the, how their insurance is going to allow them to, to access our system and optimize um, what we want to do. All of that is problem solving. And really at the heart of leadership is solving problems. You know, most people kind of think of leadership as a triangle with the leader at the top. That's not it at all. The triangle's upside down and the leader's at the bottom. Your whole job as a leader is to solve the problems for those that are actually doing the mission and making them successful. Uh, General Colin Powell said, and I'm paraphrasing, is that the day people stop bringing the problems to you is the day you stop being a leader. And that is so absolutely true. So if you like solving problems, 
then leadership is an opportunity to really kind of put that out there because you, you really, there's a, a really a great book called Patients Come Second. And obviously that book's title is incredibly provocative, but the goal of that book is to say that if you're a healthcare executive, your job is not to worry about the patient. Your job is to actually worry about the healthcare providers and the teams that support them so that they can then worry about the patient. And you're trying to create an environment so that healthcare professionals with their support staff can actually excel. So if you haven't read the book, Patients Come Second, and you're interested in leadership, I would strongly encourage it. It's a really good book. And then they have a follow-on book called Beyond Heroes. Um, but both of those books, as I read them, made me think, this is what PTs do day in, day out. We are constantly there for service and selfless service. And really that selfless service is actually what makes you a really good leader. Because again, as a leader, you aren't at the top, people just feeding you information, although they do give you information. Your job is to flip it around and make sure you support everyone that's on the front lines and making sure that they can be as successful as possible. So to me, leadership is about scaling what we do on a one-on-one -on -one basis with our patients and creating environment so that all healthcare providers and their support teams can excel. Um, so I hope that answered your question, um, but I, and I probably added a little bit more to that, but it, it, it's, um, it, it comes down to me as problem solving and realizing that as a leader, your job is just to solve problems and, 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 and bring people along with you as you solve those problems. Because you can have a great idea and if no one wants to do it, it'll just sit on the shelf. But I think that idea of motivational interviewing, bringing patients along when you scale it in leadership is you're bringing teams along with the idea, you're painting a vision, you're creating a path forward and then coaching people along the way to get there. Thank you, uh, Colonel Zahan. Uh, we have Ethan with his hand up. Yeah, and um, so that was an awesome question by uh, Gus and you answered some of it of what I was gonna ask, but I'm sure you could expand a little bit more. So even like you yourself, you didn't exactly say that you always knew that you would be the one to seek out like an executive leadership position and you know you mentioned problem solving as a huge characteristic of someone who would be good at that but besides that how do we know if we're the one that's supposed to go for that executive position uh what a good question and, and what you'll find really important after you graduate is to understanding your why what motivates you to get up and go to work every day? What makes you want to be the best at what you're doing? Everyone's internal why will be very different. Um, my internal why has evolved over time, right? It started with wanting to help patients. Then it went into really wanting to advance the profession through research and education. And then it became more as advancing the profession in all of healthcare by creating a, a transitioning the uh, healthcare system to a system for health. And it's that why that made me want to be a leader. What's really interesting to me is a lot of the folks I know who had a goal of leadership, but they didn't understand their why, they're not good leaders. They actually want it for the power, they want it for the title, they want it for like, they think it's a glorious thing to be a healthcare executive, right? They're in it for maybe some of the wrong reasons where if you grow up understanding your why and you're trying to, I don't mean to be cliche, but make the world a better place, right? And you're trying to figure out how to do that. You then become a leader because you're following your passion of your why. Sometimes they talk the difference between a profession and a careerist. In a career, you go to job 40 hours a week, you have a title, you have pay. In a profession, you have a calling. You actually have a, a reason that you get up in the morning, your why and your career come together, and that makes you a professional. Um, believe it or not, there's some really interesting um, conversations on our, you know, 
our physical therapists, where they are on that spectrum of careerist versus a professional. And the reality is that every healthcare profession has people on all those extremes where for people that it's a job, they might do it part-time or full-time, but their focus is outside of their job versus the folks like um, those that went to the board of directors who this is their passion, right? This is, this is what they do. They want to make the professional profession better and they continually invest in their own continuing education and training. Getting back to your original question, it's those people that are driven by an internal why that make the best leaders. And what you find, at least I have found, is that the, the seeking the leadership position was because I wanted to get after my why and the position allowed me to do it better than actually wanting the position. I quite honestly am not worried about the title. I'm quite honestly not worried about those type of things. I just want to make the difference for America's sons and daughters who qualify and volunteer to serve our nation. And, and so that is really kind of that why for me. And uh, I think that's the difference. And, and, and um, we, have a, we have what's called brigade commanders, battalion commanders, and company commanders. And at, at this point in my career, I have hired a lot of company commanders, right? And, and I've had, a, and the ones that actually wanted the title usually did the worst. The ones that actually wanted to just come in and help soldiers um, did the best. Um, and so I, 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 I've seen it both from my own journey and then those that are coming behind me. Thank you for that, Colonel Sahan. Um, one thing that, uh, you know, you, I feel like throughout this conversation, we've been talking about that why. Um, and it, it kind of makes me think of, uh, of, a, of, of a book, Start With Why. I don't know. Is that in your bookshelf by any chance, Colonel Taylor? It is. Sweet. It is. Um, so I, I know that um, that's been a book that's definitely uh, helped me figure out that concept and, and, and really try to hone in and be aware of it. Um, so in, in coming to leadership, what resources um, do you use? Um, and I know earlier, right before we started, you asked uh, some of us, you were like, hey, what, um, what, what did you do to invest in yourself? So what are those resources that you would advise us students to, to invest in ourselves or, or practices that we can adopt? Yeah, I would say uh, I'll, I'll start with what you ended with and then go back to the start of the question. I would ask all of you guys, as people entering this profession, realize burnout is a real thing. And, and so, you know, you have to take to realize that you're entering a profession that you can grow and develop in but it is an endurance rate. Adulting is an endurance event, right? You don't get to decide to stop adulting, right? Um, and so what do you do to keep your energy up, your, your motivation up? And really our profession requires us to invest so much in our patients. The reason I like motivational interviewing is that I found it decreases providers burnout. Because when you feel like you own the patient's problem and the path forward, you carry a burden um, that really is, is draining on your own energy. But when you do motivational interviewing and you're standing side by side with your patient and you're coaching them along their journey to health, you don't have to actually go home and carry that burden as much. I say that because how you manage your own energy um, there's a great book called Eat, Move, Sleep um, that really gives you daily kind of small little challenges you can do to invest um, in, in your health. And, and um, he has a, um, a follow on books um, that are really interesting and even one for, for kids about how to keep their energy levels up. But, you know, the idea is that, you, you know, just like on a plane, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on others. I, I ask that as students, you think through that as you enter this career. Right now, you have a whole bunch of energy. You're motivated. You're joining one of the best professions in the healthcare industry. But then as you get out there, you're going to realize it's an endurance event. And what do you do on the weekends to refill your energy? Do you go hiking? Do you go swimming? Do you go biking? Do you um, go and do yoga? Do you like to read? Do you like to go to sporting events? What are those things that you're going to refill your energy level on the weekend? So that's the one thing we were talking about before that I think is really critical. 
Um, the other piece of that is really investing professionally, and this gets to the first part of your question, is you know, just as you go to a continuing education course for how to better treat back pain or knee pain, you know, go to those healthcare executive um, courses, right? There's the American College of Healthcare Executives that you can participate in where they teach you about how to be a better healthcare executive. And I would say that those lessons from uh, American healthcare executives teach, it, teach me lessons at every level of leadership. The Army sends you back to training. And so you have officer basic captain's career course at, at, in multiple courses till you get up to Army War College. But those actually train us very systematically how to be better leaders. But really, it's also being an avid reader and really realizing that every day when you're able to lead those around you, are you making those around you better? And what did you do that actually helped invest in your teammates? You know, the hardest part is realizing what's going through your head might not need to come out of your mouth to get the outcome you want, right? And so that leadership, that one-on-one -on -one leadership is really critical at that base level is how do you communicate for effect? And we know that for our patients, we know that for our children, we know that for our pets, but sometimes when we lead others, we, we let our guard down and we really kind of say what's in between our ears without filtering it with the outcome that's going to have. Is what you're saying going to make your team stronger or is what you're saying going to degrade trust and degrade teamwork across your team, but might make you feel better because you got a zinger in, right? <laughs> you got to watch that. So leadership starts at every level and, and really grows with you over time. Oh, thank you for that, Colonel Tahan. Um, and as, as we're coming uh, closer to the end, and, and I really want to get an opportunity for also um, to have, have you maybe ask us some questions um, uh, of anything you want to know about us students and so forth, or students to, uh, to talk a little bit more about who you are, Colonel uh, Tehan. But one, one last uh, question that I have for you um, pertaining to this portion is, what advice um, would you give yourself if you could go back in time to, to coming out of school or, or, or um, being a new grad, being in school or being a new grad? You know, um, don't over, don't over plan or overthink it. Um, I, I would say just trust yourself, trust the journey you're getting ready to start and realize that in, as I started off in our profession, you have many ways to keep sure, ensuring that what you're doing is aligned with, with where you're at at this time in your, in your life. So I, I would say not overthink it. Know where you're wanting to go, but realize that you don't have to know your end state to know what you want as your next short-term goals. And, and realizing that that end state will evolve over time. Um, you know, I bet most people that become the APTA president didn't plan as a student that they were someday going to be the APTA president, right? That happened over time by different opportunities where they tried something out, they enjoyed it and said, you know what, I think I'm adding value to this. Let me see what else I can do, right? So maybe you start off on, on working on a committee for APTA and then you go on to actually joining the, the committee leadership as are either the chair, the co-chair, the nominating committee, et cetera, right? And then you just keep going up from there based on what actually you feel you give value back to society and the organization and at the same time works with um, your goals and objectives and, and it makes that nice balance. Um, and so that's what I would say. Thank you, Colonel Tahan, for a wonderful evening um, uh, teaching us about pursuing our leadership potential, learning about your journey, and, and more importantly, those uh, leadership pearls uh, that you shared with us. So thank you for that, Colonel Dan. Uh, now we would like to um, go to a different section of, of our student socials, which will be our, our student breakout rooms. And what we um, are thinking of is to just kind of keep it in the same room as we are now, guys. Um, so um, please, um, in, the, in the comments, you know, put a little bit about yourself, uh, what year you are, where you're from. Um, that way Colonel Tehan can, can see uh, where everybody's from. And also Colonel Tan, please feel free to, you know, you can ask one of us a question or, or just in general, 
Um, but I know their chase started asking something about a pup earlier uh, to kind of take it off to the more fun side of things. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I have a golden retriever who, when I start a Zoom call, just becomes so intrigued. So if you saw me moving like this, she was playing. T I was playing tug of war on the side, but I, I her, my husband took her. Um, so I think they're outside right now. But yeah, I have a a, a golden. Her name is Kailani. And Kailani is a Hawaiian, she, we, we got her when we were in Hawaii, and it, it's a Hawaiian for warrior queen, because as a puppy, she really thought she was a warrior queen. <laughs> she, was, she was hard to control as a puppy. Can I just say that I'm very relieved. After I hit send, I was like, oh my God, what if she has a child? And I just insulted her by saying, show us your dog. <laughs> so I'm well, so glad I, that you have a golden retriever. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, but I felt bad because again, I'm trying to keep her quiet, but she's like tugging me off to the side, but I think they went outside. So um, anyways, if she comes back in, I'll, I'll show you guys Kailani. How do you spell that, Colonel Dan? Uh, K-A-I-L-A-N-I. Um, but yeah, it's Hawaiian for warrior queen. So I guess I have a question for you all as, as a new students, what makes you most excited about enter, entering our profession? Cause I've already told you, I think it's the best profession out there, but what makes you guys excited about it? I mean, I would say like from my experience, just, uh, finishing up in clinical, it was just, awesome to be able to help someone, although I don't have my license, but working with my CI and then working with patients, kind of like how you were saying, identifying those problems and trying to solve them. It, it was definitely an amazing experience. So that's, I think the most excited I am about entering the profession, actually getting to spend that time with patients and hopefully solving those problems as well. And the great news is we spend more time with our patients than almost every profession except for psychologists. <laughs> so psychologists gets a little bit more time with their patients, but almost all other professions, um, even primary care, um, new appointments are like seven minutes, 10 minutes. You, you know, that's just insane, right? I, you know, I, I don't know what your new appointments are, but I've been blessed through my career to have 30 to 45 minutes as my new appointment slot. So um, we get so much more time than a lot of our other professions do to really help patients on their journey to health. So if that's what gets you excited, you're going to love it. Now, one thing that, um, that gets me really excited is, um, you know, I, I come from uh, a Mexican uh, background and, and being able to communicate with patients um, and, and teach them about evidence-based practices um, in Spanish and the, and the language they know. And it reminds me of my parents, right? My parents didn't, language barriers didn't really go to healthcare professionals and things of that sort. So there was a lot of things that we didn't know about, uh, but being able to, to, to be that ind individual to, to help, not just about PT, but also other resources that exist um, and try to drive that, that change, not just when they're coming, as you would say, as patients, but also um, as, as individuals, as humans, um, as people. Um, and, and trying to really motivate and, and, and make that change. Yeah. And that is so critical. You know, um, I, I, I would say that what you're saying is so critical to make sure we get um, a healthcare system that can treat all individuals in, in, in a way that they need to be met. Um, and we make sure we go after really some underserved areas, which could be rural, it could be the Indian Health Service, it could be um, inner city, it could be um, language as a barrier, but our job is to break down all those barriers and meet people where they need to be met. I had the real joy of working with the presidential task force on this during COVID-19, where the focus is, you know, making sure that we get out to every single, every single American had access to monoclonal antibodies, regardless of, of race, ethnicity, language barriers, income status, et cetera, and really breaking down those barriers. So what you've just said is so important because a healthcare system has to work for everybody um, that's impaneled to it. And in, in the US healthcare system has to, to work for really the melting pot that makes our country so amazing. Um, and, and to do that, we have to have diversity across the professions. And uh, I'm so glad you're doing that. Thank you. Thank you.
Who else? I see a whole bunch of people. I saw somebody that's at Did Ohio State. Uh, oh, go no. Hawkeyes. Yeah, OK, OK. I was, again, could have gone either way. People really love OSU or they hate OSU, so. I, I'm, I'm from Canton, Ohio. And, OK, um, yeah. And then my undergrad is from Ohio Wesleyan University, which is about 20 minutes outside of Columbus and Delaware, Ohio. So go OSU. All right, I have yeah, family go Bucks. in Florida. I have family in Florida, so excited for that. Um, Pacific University in Oregon is a great program. Um, University of New England in Portland, Maine. Oh my gosh, what an amazing program that is. I'm excited to see where everyone's going. This is awesome. Angela State, uh, Texas just has great programs all around. So that's wonderful. And Ithaca, man, that's also a really good program. Look at you guys all interested in professional development while being a student and having to like learn the, the you know, get into the profession and at the same time investing in this. I, I, I bet a lot of the folks on this call are going to be future leaders of our organization um, because you're already leading while you're a student. This is phenomenal. What great programs and really uh, your gift of time is absolutely fantastic. And I think Jackie was going to answer your question earlier, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Jackie? I was. Um, I am really excited in our profession to be able to educate our patients, not only to self-advocate what you guys were just talking about, um, but also even more basic education. Like, for example, I'm in an acute care pediatric rotation right now, and we have a mom um, who this is her first child and she has no family locally and nobody really to like get information from. And her child is 10 months old and is presenting like a six month old, just super delayed because she doesn't know how to help him. Um, and so just teaching him little things and seeing his joy in learning how to move and then seeing her joy in seeing him move is really exciting. Um, so that's what I'm most excited about, I think, in our profession. So I want to I want to unpack that a little bit because I think <laughs> what you said is so profound, right? You know, I had a boss. Her name was uh, B J Randolph, and she said, "I'm just going to help one person each day get through the system and understand how to navigate medicine and really help them." And what you're saying is so important. This family clearly has some challenges ahead of them that you're helping them with. But just think, what's great is you know, in some of our states now, we can refer to dietitians, right? So when you have a child that's failing to thrive, you can bring in the nutrition piece of it. You can bring in the education piece for the parent. Um, you can get them into community services with a social worker to make sure they have that support network. And, you know, before we had direct access, those referrals really couldn't come from us. And now some of our states, you still have to go back to primary care to get the referral. I get that. But we now actually have a seat at the table in which we can actually do that. We're trained to do that. And we have the knowledge to make sure we're going to help this family holistically and not just what brought them in. And um, I, I will say when, when I was a student in 93, um, you would get these really strict referrals and you really weren't supposed to go outside of that from the left or the right boundary of what the referral had, right? And now our profession, here we are, um, what, I'm 28 years in the army. Um, our profession now, we go back to primary care and have a conversation and, and we can advance it for the patient. And, and that just didn't happen in, in, in the early 90s. Um, it is such a better place our profession's in so that you can help this family, not only in that engagement you have with them, but making sure that they, they know what other resources are out there that can really help them. And that's just phenomenal. And that, that, you know, that's, there's nothing more important than helping a patient, a family get to a better state of health. And that's the foundation of the, success, the whole US healthcare system needs, but it starts with that individual provider patient interaction.
Well, uh, Colonel Tahan, we're coming up to the to our full hour, and and uh, and that's the allotted time we had for this for this awesome conversation. So, uh, just again, thank you, Colonel Tahan, for for coming on and speaking with us. I, I hope to connect with you again um, here in the upcoming weeks in in, in DC. Uh, hopefully, see some of your dancing moves uh, at at the gala. But um, is there a way that, you know, we you have any social media or anything um, to contact you with um, or to kind of follow you on, on social media? Yeah, I, I'm more comfortable with Facebook um, than I am with Twitter, but I'm on both. And, and so um, uh, please feel free to uh, you know, follow me either on Facebook or, or Twitter. I, I normally post mostly in Facebook, though. Um, probably can tell by my age i've been doing this for a while <laughs> there's, there's a certain demographic right so uh, I, I you guys might be more comfortable on other platforms but uh um i i'm mostly on facebook awesome awesome thank you colonel uh tahan for sharing that and and uh how 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 is to how would we find you is it well my name's unique enough so just searching for deidre tahan will get you there and then on twitter it's at d tahan just my first initial d and the last name tahan um so at d tahan um on twitter and then deidre tahan on facebook and i think i'm it i don't think there's other any no other deidre tahans in the whole facebook <laughs> <laughs> no thank you again colonel uh for this wonderful evening and and thank you students for coming on um, and being part of the student social and, and engaging um, for the future of our profession um, and exploring what it is, uh, what's your potential um, in leadership. So thank you guys. Thank you everybody who came on. Y'all have a wonderful night.